think less government's better. Um, maybe it's because I come from small business. Let me say the three committees I'm on. I'm on Ag, very appropriate for the district. Veterans Affairs, very appropriate for the district. And small business. Let me tell you one of the assignments that I've get, been given uh, in small business is um, I was put on a, a spe special subcommittee uh, that is actually several committees where there's two members from each of these small business, I think it's a ways and means, one other. At any rate, our job, and this is where I'm gonna ask you, our job and assignment is, is to find where it is that in certain businesses, certain agencies are duplicative in nature. So in other words, they come in and they want to audit you here, and next day you know it, and somebody else is auditing you on the exact same thing, and they come in and mess with your business way too much. I wanna hear about that because I wanna take those arguments back. Or also, where you feel that in your business, that there's old, overburdens of regulations that actually do nothing, but slow down your business and your opportunity for business growth. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to realize this is a great and wonderful country, but unfortunately, unfortunately, government has grown to a point, and it was, whether it's the IRS, EPA, this goes on and on, where we are doing so many things to stop our small business and large business alike from competing in a worldwide market. Where other countries are giving hands up, we're pinning our people down. I guess one of the best explanations I've ever heard is uh, Kevin McCarthy described it. He said somewhere after the Second World War, when competing uh, in a worldwide market, America was it's like swimming in a swim meet. And all of a sudden, when, it, when, when, when we were swimming, we were four links, four links ahead of anybody else. Well, somebody decided in the government, that's just not fair. And so what we're gonna do is, is we're gonna put some regulations on, and, and so we're gonna pay, take a five pound weight, we're gonna wrap around your waist, and we're gonna be able to slow you down a little bit. So, because obviously we're not doing something right if we're that far ahead, right? And so we put that weight around, and, and then we were still two lengths ahead. And so then, then oh, let's add another 10 pounds and see. And, and, and now we've, we've got the point, guess what? We're at the point we're gonna fall behind, and the government needs to shed the weight. And I think that's kind of my job. Okay. Now there's a lot to do with my job. Let, let me explain this. I believe that the federal government has certain responsibilities under the Constitution. Protect our borders. Deal with national defense. Deal with foreign trade. Provide for an interstate commerce, interstate commerce, trading between states. Other than that, there's not a lot that is in our constitution, yet we tax so that we can provide and work so that we can take control of certain things that I believe are not part of what the federal government should do. Now understand, that doesn't mean I want to close them down because we have to make sense. But education was never part of the federal government's job. That was a state's job. That was a state's job. But yet, every time you turn around, whether it's Republican or Democrat, we're coming up with some new program that we're gonna take and we're gonna put on our teachers and our students and we're gonna say you have to meet certain things and we're gonna do it from the federal level and there's no way that we can implement the rules because we're not there and because what's educating children in O'Fallon is completely different than New York. Let me tell you that in a short period of time also, um, I went from, in the state, uh, I had myself and a legislative director. That's how, how you rent from your state office. And then you had a secretary in Springfield. <laughs> I've got a total of 16 staff. You can have up to about 18, not counting interns. Um, you've got a legislative director in DC and then a staff underneath him uh, or her. And then your, your chief of staff is located there. I have Matt, which I wanna say, introduce Matt. Uh, Matt Rice is the district director, which he coordinates all of those 12 counties where we have an office here in Belleville on the square and an office in Carbondale to try to have access to everybody. We've got four people in Belleville and two people in right now. Um, so it's a small business in itself. Uh, so I think we're doing a good job. We're getting a lot of compliments on what we're doing. 
Um, but once again, I'm talking too much, and I'm going to go ahead and throw it out to you for any questions you might have. Uh, anything at all? Okay, great. I'm going to go ahead. <laughs> yes, sir. What are your uh, views on minimum uh, wage? My views on minimum wage are if you want to raise minimum wage, increase the amount of jobs that are available. Because what will happen with minimum wage is, um, the best example I have of that is a state legislator. In Perryville, Missouri, um, there were no minimum wage jobs a few years ago. Do you know why? Because unemployment was 2%. Because the market itself will make it to where McDonald's, Walmart, what, whatever, whoever's paying minimum wage to get quality employees are gonna to have to increase their wages. But it's based on a market-driven situation. So, and boy, do I take a lot of heat for that. I, I was a union firefighter too, by the way. But, but I take a lot of heat from you. Oh, what do you mean? You know, which I don't understand because if you falsely increase the minimum wage, who do you think it's gonna hurt? It's gonna hurt the middle-income family. It's gonna hurt the middle-income family. That's, that's who it hurts. And that's because your products, I don't need to explain this to the room, but I'm going to anyway, uh, it's because the cost of those things, uh, you use the fast food restaurant. You use uh, the places where the minimum wage worker is. And minimum wage was never meant to be a living wage, ever. Minimum wage was set so that those people who after they retire want to go out and keep themselves busy and students that are working to learn how to work, to have a job, have extra. But if if we want to raise the minimum wage to a living wage, then get rid of all public aid. I, and we work well together, Republican and Democrat, we're, we're working good on this. But the concerns that they have, are like, oh man, we're not sure. And so you're getting some negative vibes. I did talk with Jerry Costello and I worked together on this as well. And I called him what the concerns that the locals had. He said, well, I think we're still about 70 to 30 that we're gonna get it because we have the best location. We have everyone in agreement that that is a good thing. You go across the river where the other proposal is, that you, many of that is gonna, they're gonna have to use uh, eminent domain to take some of the property. People are ticked off. Um, I, I talked with Lacey Clay early on in this process. He said, hey, you're trying to take our job. I said, no, I'm just trying to take jobs. And I said, uh, and he goes, he goes, well, we're going to fight you. And I said, okay. He said, but to tell you the truth, you guys are all united, and I got a whole lot of people over here. <laughs> and I said, that's okay. I hope it's going to work out. So we'll see how it pans out. March is when we'll get yeah, more about it. Okay, March. <laughs>